On November 17, 2005, some residents of a condominium in Osaka, Japan, saw smoke coming out of one of the apartments. Realizing that a fire had broken out, they hurried to get in touch with local authorities. A few minutes later, firefighters arrived on the scene, entered the building and managed to put out the flames in the unit. It was then that they found the lifeless remains of the two young tenants. However, it didn't take long for them to notice on their bodies brutal wounds clearly not caused by the fire. The story I'll tell you today is the tragic case of Yukio Yamaji, a case that, at the time, shook many in Japan not only for the brutality of the crimes, but also because they could have been easily predictable and probably preventable, if only more attention had been paid. Let's start from the beginning. Yukio Yamaji was born in 1983 in the city of Yamaguchi in southern Japan. Despite the fact that in those years Japan was going through a period of huge economic prosperity, not everyone was in a position to benefit from it. Among them were Yukio's parents. His mother worked as a cashier in a store, while his father moved from job to job, spending most of his meager earnings on alcohol. Unfortunately for the man, his drinking habit proved to be fatal, as he died of liver cirrhosis within a few years, leaving his wife and son in even worse economic conditions than they already were. Meanwhile, Yukio had finished elementary school and was tackling middle school. His very shy personality didn't help him in interacting with his classmates, especially with the girls. So, he always ended up isolating himself and often didn't even bother attending class. Partly due to difficulties at school and partly to help his mother with household expenses, the boy eventually decided to leave his studies and at 16 years old he was already working as a newspaper delivery boy around the city. It was during this time that he fell in love. A new employee had just arrived in the toy shop that he had frequented since he was a child, a pretty, kind woman, seven years older than he was. They started talking and before long they became intimate. For her, however, it was little more than a game, there was simply too big of an age gap, so she soon decided it was time to end the relationship. Meanwhile, the boy's mother, unsure about the nature of her son's relationship and suspecting that the woman was taking advantage of him, decided to call her on the phone. This was enough to enrage Yukio, who saw his mother's action as an unacceptable intrusion and was convinced that she was the one who caused the breakup by making the phone call. So, on July 16, 2000, the young man bought a metal baseball bat, sneaked up on his mother and hit her violently on the head. The woman staggered for a moment, trying to regain her balance, but Yukio attacked again, hitting her over and over until her face became an indistinguishable mask of blood. The following day, he called his lover and invited her over for lunch. As they were eating, he kept asking her if she could smell blood. A few days later, he voluntarily turned himself in to the police for the murder of his mother. During the trial, he explained that he had decided to kill his mother because she had called the woman he was seeing, trying to end the relationship. Also, he claimed that she was spending too much money and had accumulated enormous debts and things could not keep going on that way. Despite these worrying statements, given his young age and the difficult family situation he had experienced as a child, and because the murder did not seem to have been premeditated, the court assessed that Yukio could be rehabilitated. Therefore, they had him incarcerated in a juvenile detention center where he had the opportunity to continue his studies and reform. During that period of confinement, the boy used this time to study and obtain various qualifications. He also underwent exams that revealed he had a mental disorder that prevented him from forming lasting relationships with other people. Despite the severity of his crime, after only three years, a judge deemed him rehabilitated and had him released. Upon his release from prison, since both his parents had now passed away and he had no money, Yukio stayed briefly with his grandmother. He hoped to find the woman he once dated, but evidently she had decided to take advantage of his imprisonment to get rid of him, and was never seen again. Therefore, after only three months, Yukio went to live alone in another city, where he found work in a pachinko parlor, a sort of Japanese equivalent to slot machines, periodically returning to Yamaguchi in the futile attempt to find the woman he loved. While working at the pachinko parlor, he got into the habit of stealing coins from the machines to supplement his salary, and ended up getting to know other thieves like him, with whom he began to travel the country living by his wits. They often visited establishments known as hostess bars, 
places where customers, mostly men, spend time drinking and chatting with beautiful girls who are employed by the bars to entertain guests. Much to the disappointment of his associates, despite the artificial environment within the clubs, Yukio continued to be unable to relate to women, inevitably ending up ruining everyone's evening. The difficulty with socializing, combined with the fact of frequenting an unhealthy environment and always living day to day, couldn't but worsen the already precarious state of his mental health. It had now been two years since he was released, and Yukio's wandering had led him to temporarily settle down in a condominium in Osaka. In the midst of the coming and going of people in the building, his attention was captured by a young woman. Yukio didn't know her, but her look reminded him of the woman he had dated in Yamaguchi. Very soon, his interest turned into a morbid desire, and he began following the woman until he discovered which apartment she lived in. He was completely obsessed with her. On November 16, 2005, he went to investigate to find out whether the apartment next to the woman's was occupied. Seeing that it was not, the following day he forced open the lock of the apartment and hid inside. When the woman returned home from work, Yukio came out of the place where he was hiding and attacked her with a butcher knife. He stabbed her several times and sexually assaulted her. When the woman's younger sister, who also lived in the apartment, returned home as well, Yukio attacked her with the same brutality. As he himself would later admit in court, stabbing the two girls gave him a sexual pleasure equal only to what he had felt in killing his mother. For this reason, he had struck them over and over again in various parts of the body, in order to increase his arousal. Having raped and killed both sisters, Yukio took the time to smoke a cigarette on the balcony before setting the apartment on fire and leaving. When the firefighters, called by other tenants of the building, entered the apartment to tame the fire, they found the lifeless bodies of Azuka Weara, 27 years old, and her 19-year-old sister Chihiro. The police immediately launched an investigation, questioning acquaintances of the victims and residents of the building. When, on December 5th, came Yukio's turn, investigators had already identified him as a possible suspect. However, to the prosecutor's surprise, the man spontaneously admitted to being the perpetrator of the double murder. Apparently, what convinced him to speak was the fact that the prosecutor assigned to the case was a beautiful woman. He explained that the motive for the murder was the fact that, in killing his mother, he had really enjoyed himself. In the years that followed, the memory of the moment had never left him, and he wanted to experience the gratifying sensation once again. I wanted to see human blood, he added. The target could have been anyone, not just these two. After confessing to the murder, Yukio led the police to the location of the murder weapon, which he had buried near a shrine a few hundred meters away. Following his confession, he was of course arrested. In his apartment, investigators found a lighter belonging to one of the victims, which the man had probably used to set the house on fire and then kept as a souvenir. Given the severity of the crime and the total absence of remorse on the part of the defendant, the prosecutors asked for the death penalty. The fact that Yukio has stated in court that, if released, he would probably kill again, gave the prosecution even more strength in making their case for the capital punishment. The defense attorney argued that his client was incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong and that, following a psychiatric evaluation, he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, a disorder that, among other things, causes difficulty in interacting with others. Therefore, he argued that he was unfit for trial due to his mental illness. The judge, however, sided with the prosecution, and the trial proceeded quickly until May 2006, when Yukio was found guilty of the double murder. According to his lawyer, by then he no longer had the will to live, and was himself asking to be executed as soon as possible. As requested by the prosecution, he was sentenced to death, and the sentence was carried out in 2009, thus making him, at just 25 years old, the youngest person to be executed in Japan since 1972. Thank you for watching.